Kramer's here. I am Marcia Kramer. And on behalf of CBS2 and WLNY TV 1055, along with our partners, WCBS Radio 880, 1010 Women's News, the New York Daily News, the City University of New York, the New York Immigration Coalition, and Common Cause New York, we'd like to welcome you to our final series of town hall meetings. Joining me on the panel tonight is Jillian Jorgensen. She's the City Hall Bureau Chief of the New York Daily News. Jillian. Thanks, Marcia. Our coalition has been awarded the mayoral debates this fall by the New York City Campaign Finance Board. And in preparation for that, we want to hear from the voices of real New Yorkers. So also joining us on the panel tonight is Peter Haskell from WCBS News Radio AA. Peter. These meetings have been held in all five New York City boroughs throughout the month of June, and it's one way for New Yorkers to share your concerns with us. Let your voice be heard. We want to hear from you what qualities you'd like to see in this year's candidates for mayor, controller, and public advocate. And finally, Juliet Papa from 1010 Wins News. And together, as news and civic organizations committed to community engagement, we would like the issues raised to reflect the concerns of all of you, New Yorkers, from every corner of the city, from Harlem to Newark Beach, and from Pelham Park to Astoria and Crown Heights. So this is truly your floor and forum, and we're here to listen. So please take this opportunity to ask away. Now, we will be recording your questions and concerns and sharing them with our viewers and our listeners. So, the town hall meeting is being streamed live on cbsnewyork.com as we speak. So thank you for being here, and back to you, Marcia. Thank you, Julia. Now, before we get started, we'd like to thank our gracious hosts here at the College of Staten Island. Thank you very, very much for having us. And in the spirit of maximizing participation and making sure we can hear from as many of you as possible, we ask your cooperation with a few ground rules. If you have a question or comment, Please line up in front of the microphone if you stand to the side of the stage. That's the microphone right here. And if you'd like to follow up, please keep your comments brief so we don't run out of time. And if you have a comment you would like to make in Spanish, we will, we will help you with translating for the rest of the audience. Also, if you don't have a chance to express your concerns this evening or would like to do so afterwards, we are happy to hear them from our respective social media pages or you can leave written questions with our staff after the meeting. Now with that, let's get started, and if you have a question, please come over to the microphone and we can have a conversation. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Maybe you can tell us your name and where is that you live. Certainly, my name is Marianne Simone, and I live in West Brighton. And so what's your question for any of the candidates that are running for the mayor or citywide elder? Certainly, one of the issues that affects everyone on Staten Island, as well as everyone in New York City and the country, is health care. One of my big concerns on Staten Island is the lack of hospital beds. We are the only borough that doesn't have a city hospital. Now, the Health and Hospital Corporation will tell you, well, certainly you do, you have the Seafood Hospital. But Seafood Hospital is a rehabilitation hospital. It is not a hospital in the sense that if I have to take my child to the emergency room, you're not going to take that child to see you. I have had multiple occasions of being in an emergency room here on Staten Island, and because of the lack of beds available and the lack of personnel, I've had some nightmare experiences. Most recently, in March of this year, I went to Staten Island University Hospital to the emergency department, I counted in the waiting room. There were over 50 people waiting in the waiting room. And so the guard said to me, uh, are you aware of the registration area? I said, yes, I'm perfectly aware of the registration area and where it is. And I called my husband on the phone and said, don't park the car, we're going to Manhattan, to Roosevelt Hospital. Now, fortunately, um, we could do that, but sometimes we can't do that. And sometimes there are people who don't have access to a vehicle who can take them someplace else. So the lack of hospital beds on Staten Island is a significant problem. And when you consider that we have nearly a population of a half a million people, 
to hospitals is not sufficient. So the city is not going to build another hospital. Why aren't they funding a lot of money to our two existing hospitals so that they can expand at an adequate rate to serve the population? And that's my concern. So there are two Staten Island University Hospital locations, one on the South Shore, which has a rapidly growing population, one on the North Shore, and then we also have Richmond University Medical Center. Now, Staten Island University Hospital did have a renovation a few years back, but even then, once they did expand their emergency room, they didn't have an adequate number of beds to transfer people on. Richmond University is going through current expansion. So my question is really, would you like to We do have a number of urgent centers around the world. That's an excellent question. Of that, I am not aware. Yeah, but because maybe, you know, because my question is, do you want us to ask the candidates to expand the emergency service, or are you suggesting that maybe creation of city funding or publicly funded uh, urgent care facilities that are open 24-7 would be um, a better solution Well, it might serve certain communities that use the emergency rooms as their only go-to access to medical care to put um, urgent care centers within those neighborhoods. But in addition to that, there would have to be a whole sort of educational process for the population to understand that those are alternatives and the types of um, cases that those um, locations can serve. But I will So uh, I can tell you that uh, I did have a, an episode personally in 2006. Now Staten Island University Hospital North had just built this wonderful emergency room. A lot of new beds. Um, I was on a gurney for 12 hours, and it turned out that I had to have emergency surgery. And the reason why the surgery was an emergency is because they should not have left me untreated for 12 hours. Um, you had it here or you had it when they bring you somewhere? I had the surgery here at Staten Island University Hospital. But do you know many people who get transported to a hospital in Brooklyn or anywhere? So I don't understand and I'm not aware of what the policies are when the hospitals have like a Hicks level three or whatever they call it when they achieve a critical mass and they can't take care of all the patients that do come to them. Of course, we all know that they do have certain plans in place, although I'm not cognizant of what they are. But I do know that it is a critical situation here on Staten Island. It has been for many years, and it's only going to get worse. Do you think this is about money, or is it just neglect? That's a very good question. Um, I think it's just that they are just not paying attention to this issue here on Staten Island. You know, you have often heard people from Staten Island say that they are the forgotten borough. Um, but Staten Island does have a certainly a large population. Um, we contribute a lot of tax dollars. We should have access to services that help our population. Well, I just have another question. Uh, so if you have an emergency, mm -hmm. do people in Staten Island just drive themselves to the emergency room or do you call 
911, and the question I would have is, if you have an ambulance that responds, are they going to take you to a local hospital, or will they say, hey, it's overcrowded, I think you should go to the Brooklyn or Manhattan, you know, some places that they can do it, they can take you more slowly? Again, I, I do not have the background um, to understand how the ambulances are assigned to take patients. I do know that the uh, EMTs are empowered to make a decision as to whether or not they believe somebody should be transported. But I have also had occasion where I have had uh, an ambulance called on behalf of my mother, and the EMT said, you know, we really don't feel she needs to go via ambulance transport. She might be okay. So she's got some other issues. Now, well, I can take her. I'm not going to. Because if I do take her, we will be sitting in that waiting room with 40 people. So I would prefer that you guys take her because once she arrives in an ambulance, she's a priority patient. That's a good question. And certainly, it's a wonderful opportunity for an expose on healthcare in Staten Island. <laughs> Just how is this population being served, given the amount of tax dollars that you contribute? You raise a lot of really interesting questions, and I'm going to ask them, I promise. Um, is there anyone else that would like to come and ask a question? Sir? Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate it.
city. So are you talking buses? Are you talking water ferries? Are you talking, what, the, the, what kind of transportation would you like to see here? Yes. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so tell me, so you want, would you want a, a light rail system that would, you know, a, like say a trolley car kind of light rail system that would take you from point A to point B? And are you looking for transportation to be in Staten Island or to take you off Staten Island? I'm only talking. I'm only talking. Every option, the Sertola and the increased light rail has been talked about for 35, 40 years. It's certainly something that's reasonable, but whatever it takes to get more people with more options into Brooklyn and the city uh, so there's fewer cars is something that's not talked about because we build highways only. Where, where do you commute to? Uh, typically the city and deep into Brooklyn. Uh, would you... Would you like to see the, you know, the mayor's rolled out this um, five borough ferry plan, but of course the new ferry plan doesn't include Staten Island, which much to the dismay of many Staten Islanders. Um, would you consider taking a, like a, a water taxi or, or a ferry to work? Uh, but, you know, would would that have. help you? Or I have. Um, if it took you I to mean, the other place. than the Staten Island ferry, you know, but like, um, like, but a, I like have. a fast ferry. But yeah. I have. I used to drive into Brooklyn, and I used to work on, uh, actually it was right on Wall Street, 60 Wall Street, 120 Wall Street. I'd go to 65th Street um, by Lutheran Hospital, mm -hmm. which you know used to be a dump, and now it's a real place. <laughs> okay, it's not so skip. Everyone wants it. after uh, Williamsburg is probably gonna be the next hot spot. You go there, and you get on a little cute little ferry, and you go right across the Wall Street. I don't know if it's still there, but I did it for three years, about ten years ago. So, and there's also a ferry. There used to be a ferry very briefly from deep Staten Island. Yeah, from they Great went Hills all the way up to 34th. Yeah. So subsidize it. You know, what, whatever it takes to reduce road traffic, 10% is a success. And would a 10% uh, reduction in road traffic make a big difference in terms of using the highways that exist today? I take it three days a week, and I'm not Mr. Scientific on this one, but yes, if you reduce road traffic 10%, people's so, daily commute would be much better. So the second issue that you raised, if I remember correctly, was homelessness. Yeah. And your comment was that we're spending as much building uh, places for the homeless at, or dealing with people who are homeless as we're building houses. Yeah. So a chronic problem, there's a twofold problem in homelessness. One is a lot of people, especially in Staten Island, seem to be put into hotel rooms. and there's also the question of locate, locating new homeless shelters. And it's always traditionally a difficult thing to locate a, a homeless shelter because many communities don't want to have them in their neighborhood. So where do you stand on that? I mean, do you want the people who are homeless in Staten Island to live in the communities where they were raised or brought up, or should they be taken off Staten Island to other locations? Um, I, I noticed that I, I get this gut feeling that if we were in a room talking about things, that you and I just see things from different perspectives, and that's good. I have no perspective. And I'm just trying well, to. But I, you I just presented one. That's all. I'm I mean, I'm just that. trying to find out what, because we we're trying to frame questions right. for elected officials, right. so we want to give them specifics. Um, anyone who is homeless deserves a place to right themselves. They deserve that. I, I understand that there's an interest to have homelessness taken care of in your community. With all due respect to the mayor, that's happy talk for not having solved the homeless problem. Okay? Um, and I only I speak from some experiences because I've, I've been involved with homeless issues for a long time. The same issue was discussed under Mayor Dinkins. The, because of the extremely liberal homeless policies, which are good, that you should allow someone to come in, but bad if they're coming in to try to get housing paid for them. You have to try to have a conversation where anyone who comes in can get housing, but there needs to be an understanding that at some critical point, stop building a shelter and build a house. And they don't seem to, I, I, I prepared for this. We actually spend as much money now on homelessness as we do on housing. I mean, if anyone just got up there and said, you know, I disagree with you. And, you know. So what's your solution? What do you think should be done? What do you do um, with homeless people who 
are yeah. obviously yeah. don't have funds or um, have issues. And I'll throw out a few things because I certainly don't have all the answers. I work with homeless veterans, and the homeless veteran population is down 60% in the city in the past six years. But the amount of single adult homeless <coughs> is up 60%. There's been some success, and there are reasons why. <coughs> the second piece is there has to be an honest discussion about the um, right to shelter law that's in the state constitution. Um, it's been perverted. And um, we should have a connection with people who can't afford homeless, their, their, their housing about how they connect from their current situation, which maybe need some prevention, as opposed to giving them a, a, a shelter connect them somehow to prevention to that next apartment that's built. Homeless shelters cost like 60 grand a year to run. You certainly could afford a mortgage for someone's apartment at 60 grand a year. It says, you know, stay with your aunt for X amount of time. You'll be able to hook up to an apartment if you can get afford, you know, 30% of income, whatever, whatever they use now. So, so it it's, sounds frustra like it's frustrating. It's frustrating. So I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it sounds like maybe you, you <coughs> want to see a candidate propose increased, um, you know, uh, I think they usually call them eviction prevention services, whether those are legal services or sometimes they, they use short-term subsidies to help somebody pay their rent when they're going through a, a difficult time to avoid them entering the homeless shelter system in the first place, right? You, you were looking to head it off. That's um, my, my experience with those items you mentioned mm -hmm. um, always help. Mm -hmm. but they're small compared right. to the incentive of come in, and if you do, you have a uh, direct link right. to housing. Which, and, you know, I don't have a problem with that, but at the end of the day, if you're spending 60 grand a year, the taxpayer issue that I'm talking about, our tax right. book every year, I think we spend 800, just under 2 billion in homelessness. So it's, if it's they could wow. build, they could build new public build housing. Public I think housing. Yeah, yeah. So if you were going to phrase a question to the mayoral candidates about the homeless issue, how would you phrase it? How would you like us to phrase it? What policies could you put in place to um, reduce, not manage homelessness? That's a good question. Very good. I think that gets a lot of support from the room. Um, and refresh my recollection. So it was transportation, homelessness, and your third Special issue? ed. Oh, okay. <coughs> With special, special education. Ed. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, it's, um, I, I used to be on the school board for 10 years. Um, and um, it's one of those managed crises. And the, I think it's a crime because it affects children. Well, you think that the basically special ed students are warehoused? Is that your feeling? Um, under, under the Bloomberg administration, there was a recognition, finally, that public schools um, segregated special ed children. Mm -hmm. And the reason they did that is that there wasn't adequate education for public school teachers mm -hmm. to train uh, children with special needs. And the reason was is that there was a perception that a significant amount of special ed kids had horrible behavioral problems. And on Staten Island, it was combined with a certain amount of racism, too, mm -hmm. that those kids have behavioral problems are impossible to teach. So if I want to be in the best school, I want as little special ed population as necessary. <coughs> it was recognized under the Bloomberg administration that um, – you had to stop making homelessness a place and make it a service. It's improved, but because of, um, quite, quite frankly, the last administration wanted to destroy old ties. This administration wants to bring them back. And therefore, there's been a certain amount of appeasement to the old guard. And, you know, that said, I can buy that. It's just, you know, at the end of the day, um, I see what happens to kids with dyslexia. Mm -hmm. I see what, and, and it's not even a racial issue. It's, it's just sad that children are caught in this crossfire of appeasement. And on special ed, um, and also general ed, 
We know what it means to see success. It means certain scores. It means certain graduation <laughs> rates. And it's getting better with general ed kids. It's the same or worse with special ed. With special ed. And I think it's an abomination. Okay, well, thank so, you very thank much. You. And as thank we you. ask the next person to come to the microphone, I'm just going to share with you, we're, being, uh, we're, we're live streaming this, and we have some people who are watching on Facebook and Twitter. I'm going to share a couple of the questions that they've been writing in. First from Twitter, when are they going to stop raising the tolls? I bet you there's a lot of support for that in this room. From Facebook, when is the MTA going to fix the ongoing mess? Raising the fare is not the answer. They should look into reducing the fares for pain and suffering. Okay. And another question from John Milan Siebeck. How about light rail extension to New Jersey? How many people here support that? And uh, before I read any more questions, I think we have another person who wants to come up to the microphone and ask a question. So tell us your name and what you'd like to talk about. Sure, I'm Melissa from Travis. I wanted to stay on the education. Okay, sure. But for special needs students, I have a seven-year-old autistic son, and he um, he's in District 75, but there's some structure, better structure than general ed. Right. But they just kind of group everybody in. There's no, like, there are behavioral problems and there are, you know, non-communicative autistic children. So I kind of wanted to know if there's something that, the, that we can do maybe to separate them a little bit more for their needs, their specific needs, more than you know, just six to one to one, because like I know my son picks up very bad habits in the class from the children who are like violent, as opposed to. So are they separated by age right now, or are they separated you know, by grade? They are by, they kind of travel in grades. But and so you'd rather see them separated by whatever their special need is? Right, like, because I, like, with autism especially, like, there's different levels on the spectrum, so. He'll be with someone with Asperger's who can have like a crazy outburst and then he'll come home and he starts hitting us and, you know, it's... Do you think there aren't enough teachers to, uh, to help these kids? I'm not sure. Like he specifically is in a six to one to one class, which means there's a teacher, a para, and then only six children. And many of them do have their own personal paras, but it's, it just seems... That, that everybody's mixed together. It's How large are the classes? It's six so children. So the, and I'm, I'm not complaining about the size because, again, each child is different. It's just they, they don't seem to zone in on specific problems. Like there's... It's like too generalized. Said, yes, it's still a little more generalized, especially for those who don't... Like my son has started to speak, but like for years didn't speak. He's making progress but he's picking up the bad habits too. And, and, and um, so I know you said your son's in District 75. So some of those programs, I, I know, in, I don't know if NEST is in 75 or 31, that, that wouldn't be the right kind of fit, right? You're looking for something more autism. structured, right? I know, I mean, there are, there are NEST programs for, for children with autism, but I don't know if that's the same level as. Right, they don't, child. anyone who has special needs, whether they're in a wheelchair or, they'll just group them all together. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the wheelchair children are in 12 to 1 classes as opposed to a 6 to 1 class. 6 to 1 is a little more, I guess, concentrated on their protection. Because, like, I know my son is one that I worry about walking out. Right. Like, there's no sense of danger. And, like, the school has locked doors now, but there's no guarantee that he can't just sneak out, you know, kids are fast, even whether they're autistic or not. Right. So. so so it sounds like what you want to hear from the candidates is sort of what their visions are more specifically to deal with different kinds of special needs students within District 75, how, how, to, how to more individualize their, their education, which is obviously a huge right. part of special needs education in an exactly. IEP. Exactly. Yeah. Like, I know that they're very quick to, like, drop paras if they have their own personal para. Like, I know they pushed us to try it without a, his own para this year. So, you know, these are things that, like, and on Staten Island, we have a very high rate of autism now. So what is, 
what are the candidates going to do to make sure and ensure their safety and their education? Is, is this a numbers issue? I mean, you talk about the six to a class. How many of those classes are there, and would they have the numbers to be able to better break them or categorize them more efficiently? That I don't know. You know Do you know in your school, though, if there are other classes? Like we, the, the school we happen to be in are kindergarten through eighth grade, so it keeps the stability for them. Mm -hmm. But they constantly pushing them from the six to one class to eight to one to 12 to one. They try to get you out of six to one as quick as possible. Right. So, so there, there is an eight to one class also. There is an eight to one class. And, and the kids who are in that class and in the 12 to one class, how are their needs different? To be honest, I don't know. Okay. I know I just fought to keep him in six to one because I worry about his safety. <laughs> so, and it seems that you have to argue with, with the, uh, in your IEP to keep whatever services you have. Okay, well thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Yep. Thank and, you. Um, as the next person comes to the microphone, we have two more questions from our social media partners. Joanne Dittmeyer says, what is really being done about safety in the subway? All we're getting is the same old rhetoric. It's time to put safety and make it a priority, not your wallet. And then one more question from our social media partners. Arya Mack says, how about more subway stops in Midtown? I guess there's, I guess there's some support here for that as well. Um, And our next questioner, tell us your name and what your question is. Hi, uh, my name is Aaron Ross. Aaron. And uh, I actually had a couple questions. Go ahead. Um, first of all, actually, it's very interesting what she brought up about education and special needs and in particular autism. Now, I wanted to say that a couple generations ago, autism was very rare. Compared to today, it's actually, there's an epidemic in autism. And what I want to ask the mayor is, will he be able to fund research into what is causing this epidemic of this generation of autism? Because you have a lot of children who have autism today, and, and this never was like this before. And my brother, I have a younger brother who actually has uh, full-blown autism. I mean, he's 26 years old, and he speaks very, very little. He hardly talks at all. And it's sad. And I think that they need to do some research into figuring out what is causing this autism epidemic. And I think, you know, I mean, some people have said it's vaccines. And, you know, I think it's a very plausible theory because they do put mercury in some of these vaccines. And they have taken out the aerosol recently, which was something that was of concern. But they need to do some research to figure out what's causing the, this autism because you know, it, it's a very serious problem, and it's, ne it's only this generation. For previous generations, never had this. And it's something that I would like to ask the mayor to fund some research mm -hmm. into saying some, you know, true, honest studies to figure out why is this happening. So you'd like the mayor to give some money to our research hospitals that exist throughout Manhattan and, and throughout the boroughs to see if they can conduct some research studies. Exactly, and not just brush it off as genetics because, you know, there's obviously has to be some environmental factors here because, I mean, genetically, we as human beings are the same people for thousands of years and just one generation, now we have all these kids with autism. It's something that needs to be looked into. Okay. And do you have other questions you'd like to... Yes, the second question I had was also... Um, uh, pertaining to what actually uh, medi medicine and medical care. Um, you have a lot of uh, people, you know, sometimes, you know, occasionally something happens and you have to go to emergency room. And I was in the emergency room a couple years ago because I was having a very bad asthma attack and I had like allergies from all the pollen. And I went to uh, the hospital and I was left in the emergency room for six hours. They literally left me there for six hours and until a doctor came and saw me, and I, by then I was fine. He gave me Benadryl, and, and I was sent home. But then a month later, I get a bill in the mail for $3,000. $3,000! Wow. I mean, thank God I have uh, medical insurance, but to charge someone $3,000 for what? For taking my blood pressure and giving me Benadryl? I mean, this, this is not right. I mean, medical care, I mean, you have to get better care, first of all. And it shouldn't be so ridiculously expensive. I could have gone to my pharmacy and gotten Benadryl for $10. They're charging me $3,000. All it took was one Benadryl. 
and I think it's completely outrageous. And they, they needs to be do something about the, 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 these hospitals, which are very incompetent. They don't care about the patients, and it's ridiculously overpriced. Mm -hmm. okay. So what you're saying is uh, you want to understand what the inequity is to, to the level of care and the cost. Exactly. Right. And, you know, like Obamacare is about who's going to pay for this. But I think the real question is, why the heck is this so expensive to begin with? Why are they charging $3,000 for a Benadryl? Why are they charging thousands of thousands of dollars for simple procedures and things that don't need to be so ridiculously expensive? It's, it's outrageous. And I think maybe they need to do something, maybe privatize it, because, I mean, this is socialist healthcare, and I don't think it works. But I'm not going to get into that right now. But something really needs to be done, because it shouldn't be $3,000 for a Benadryl. Okay. Last, que last question, okay. and I want the mayor to be aware of this also. Um, there has been a lot of people who are in prison right now, actually. Um, many innocent people have been thrown in prison. And I know that in Brooklyn, uh, Charles Hines was the former DA, and he's actually infamous because uh, it's been recently been revealed that several dozen people have been thrown in prison, innocent people who spent many years in prison. And what they did actually recently is they created a con uh, conviction review board where now, like, they're actually looking to old cases and they see, oh, my God, all these innocent people are in prison. I would like to see if they would be willing to have a conviction review board in Staten Island as well, as well as the other boroughs. So you think instead of individual DAs doing it on their own, you think that the city should provide funds to do it in every borough, and that's a question you'd like to ask the mayor? Yes, exactly. And what will he do to hold prosecutors accountable? Because there are prosecutors who literally, they take evidence and they destroy evidence. They fabricate, actually, evidence, and they, and they a lot of innocent people are convicted of crimes they don't, com uh, because... You know, witness statements are fabricated, the videotapes are thrown out, they lie to the grand jury, they do a lot of stuff. And when prosecutors commit like this kind of, um, when they commit like this kind of misconduct, they should be held accountable. Mm -hmm. And I think that the mayor should be more aware of this, and that when the, D the Brooklyn DA, as well as any other DA, the Staten Island DA, you know, they should be held accountable when innocent people go to prison and these prosecutors, they, they should be fired when, when they get caught for committing such heinous acts. Because I just want to say before I go real quickly, because I know she wants to speak, prison is a horrible place, but when an innocent person goes to prison, uh, an innocent person goes to prison, it is tragic. It is a tragedy, and no innocent person should ever have to do that. And I just want to ask the mayor to please look into this and be aware of what's happening and do what he can, not only to free people who are in prison now, but to make sure that innocent people don't go to prison in the future. Okay. Well, thank, thank you for you. sharing thank that. And as the next person comes up to the microphone, you. I think you'll be interested to know that one of our, another question from one of our, our social media partners, of Robert Fernandez, says, my mother is part of the Ministry of Rikers Island what safety measures are being taken, and when will they close Rikers? Um, and then just two more questions, most one from Twitter. Is it possible to make voting through the mail? Answer, yes, if the legislature does it. <laughs> and lastly, Richard Romero, I think it's better to use our tax money for a road to Staten Island and to build a wall and help Puerto Rico with their debt, better than giving to Iraq. <laughs> okay. Ma'am, could you tell us who you are and what your questions are for people Hi. running for mayor? Um, yes. Hi, my name is Burl Thurman, and I'm with the North Shore Waterfront Conservancy of Staten Island. We're an environmental justice, environmental organization here on, uh -huh. on Staten Island. And my question has to do with resiliency. Um, uh, we have Very not, important for Staten Island. Yeah, you would think, right? Um, since we're an island and everything, um, uh, the North Shore does not have a resiliency plan. At and this all? Is, at all. And this is six years after Irene hit us, which was a substantial storm in terms of the impact to the North Shore. We received no help whatsoever from anyone in terms of that. We have been told that um, our deductibles would be waived, just like with the people who were affected by Hurricane Sandy. And that never happened. Um, and when Irene hit us, and we, we had um, a situation where we had sea level rise and storm surges coming into our waterfront. 
On the North Shore, we have an industrial waterfront with um, contaminated sites that date back 150 years in some cases. And the concern is, is when the storm surges come in from the Narrows, the Kill Van Cull, and Arthur Kill, it's bringing with it not just debris, but contaminants off of that waterfront that are going back towards the residential communities. So our issue in terms of resiliency is twofold. It's dealing with the sea level rise, the storm surges, and the flooding, but it also has to do with the contamination that's coming with it. So we, what we would like to know is, is when do we get our resiliency plan that also has a remediation and mitigation aspect to it as well to protect our people. What happened after Irene? They just repaired everything and then that was the end of it? And um, there was no they, future thinking or? No, they didn't, well, they didn't repair anything for us on the North Shore. Um, if your insurance companies didn't take care of it, then it, you paid for it out of pocket. Um, and no one ever followed up with any of the people on the North Shore to see if we needed anything. Um, when Sandy hit, FEMA showed up about maybe three, four weeks later, and by that time, we had already, anyone who had re um, residual um, debris or uh, on, their, on their houses or in their homes had already taken care of it because where the difference is between the North Shore and the South Shore is they have been complaining all along. The North Shore didn't start complaining until approximately, you know, 20, I guess, 2011, 2012, okay. because what would happen is, is the North Shore people would call the Quality of Life Hotline or 311, and then they would ask, are your neighbors flooded? And of course, people would say, I don't know, and then they would just put that complaint in the circular file, so it never got recorded. So in terms of the city, the city didn't even know about the North Shore's flooding issues because they, had, they, they didn't have a record. And no one has ever thought about the fact that we are, there are like 70, about 70,000 to 75,000 people living along the North Shore and about 45 to 50,000 of them living near the old industrial sites. So what do your lawmakers say? When it, it, do you approach them? What do they say when you say, why don't we have a plan and how come nobody's, nobody's talking? Plan? So Nobody, they have no answer. No answer. No answer. No, I mean, uh, it, legislation, the other thing that's happening too, and this goes with it, is that we're seeing building in areas so are that you, are- Are you concerned that the development's gonna make this problem worse? Well, it's not gonna help any. You know, it gives people, when you build in flood prone areas, it gives them a false sense of safety, okay? Because you're kind of saying by issuing a permit that a building, a residence, apartment building or whatever, um, is safe in this area, but those are all flood prone areas. And, when you talk with scientists and when you're reading what science has to say, those flood prone areas, which are flood prone now, will be underwater in about another 50 years, if that long. So th the other thing that's happening it, that we're not getting answers about is that we have wetlands. Staten Island has 72 freshwater wetlands. We have more fresh and saltwater wetlands than any of the other boroughs. And instead of those wetlands being incorporated into our resiliency infrastructure, um, development is being allowed on them. They're still issuing permits mm. like gumdrops for development in wetlands. And, you know, it's like we don't understand that because on the South Shore, they, they did the complete opposite. You know, they actually took back private properties, homes from people that were affected by Sandy to turn them back into wetland areas so that they would buffer other residential areas. You know, that's, I think that's a good point. I want to ask you that. Do you think the North Shore needs some kind of seawall or is it wetlands that can make enough of a difference? I think it should be a combination of um, Natural, air, natural areas as buffers as well as man-made areas as buffers. Because on the North Shore, we also have industries, or I should say business, well, industries, businesses that require waterfront access. And so because they're, they have, you know, marine, they use marine equipment and they're going in and out with vessels and whatnot. So it, it, for the North Shore, it's, it can't be just a seawall because there has to be access for those businesses. And we're not opposed to the businesses that are marine-based, provided they're not polluters or contaminators, or just really obnoxious. So are you <laughs> suggesting that maybe there's, there should be, that instead of a seawall, a land buffer so that 
there's like X number of yards, feet, miles, whatever from the shore so that if there is any kind of uh, rising of the sea, it doesn't go into homes and businesses. Well, what's going to have to happen is as long as there are those um, industrial businesses on the waterfront, they're going to have to come, they're going to have to be part of that buffering plan. So maybe well, they no, put up resistance? they built on stilts or, or well, elevated. No, because that just means the water just goes underneath them and comes back towards the residential. And the thing, the, the thing that separates the residential from the industrial waterfront is Richmond Terrace, which is about 65 feet wide in some areas. So there is no real room for, wow. for a physical buffer per se. So those industrial waterfront businesses that are along the waterfront that are at the same um, level as the rest of the, the residential communities, we're going to have to come up with something that protects them and in some state, in some form, and something that definitely protects the people at least long enough to give them 15 to 20 minutes to get up land. Because we know that it's not going to be, you know, a fail-safe thing where they're not going to have to leave. We're going to have to evacuate and go up land, but we just need... You want time. We want time to do that. Okay. Yeah, it seems interesting because if you're talking about storm surge, if you have a wetlands buffer, by the time it gets to you, it's probably too late, isn't it? Well, we were with, in the, with Sandy, um, the North Shore from, let's say, uh, Fort Wadsworth, all the way up until about Mariner's Harbor. And I don't know if you're familiar with Staten Island well enough, but everything from that area from Fort Wadsworth that was at sea level all the way up to Mariner's Harbor was underwater during the storm surge. So if you had a house that was within 50 feet of Richmond Terrace, you were underwater, you know, until that storm surge went out. The areas that were most protected were the areas that had wetlands. The people that lived near Arlington Marsh, which is a tidal wetland, and the people in, in, in Mariner's Marsh, which is right behind it, Arlington Marsh absorbed the impact, and then any overflow that came from that went into Mariner's Marsh. So, and that happened with all of those wetlands that are surrounding Mariner's Harbor slash Arlington. All of those people were protected. And I know that because the next day, the very next day, I got into my car and I drove the length of Richmond Terrace and went over there. And I was really concerned because there's a mobile home park not far. But luckily, they are surrounded by wetlands. And so they were protected. So I have one last question for you. Do you think that the evacuation plan is sufficient or it needs to be updated? What evacuation plan? So, <laughs> I so mean, you think there needs to be an evacuation? There should be an evacuation. We have not seen anything. I mean, if you ask any North Shore resident what is the evacuation plan that has been issued by the city, um, by the state, there isn't one. You know, so... Important question. Yeah. And, and, and these are conversations that we need to have, but we need our, our officials to want to have them too. And everyone seems to be dodging this question. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. And as you, uh, the next Thank person you. comes up, I, I have two more questions in social media. We the, the next person who's in line, can you come up? Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna, we have just a few more minutes, so if you have a question, um, we'll try to get them in. I have two more from our social media. J, uh, TJB on Twitter, how do you reconcile the tale of two cities when the whole city is falling apart? And Ethan Andrews, why is the Verrazano Toll Plaza, why if, why if the Verrazano Toll Plaza collects a billion dollars a year, is the infrastructure of the five boroughs in such poor condition? I think there's probably a lot of support for that question here too. Ma'am, tell us who you are and what your question is. Hi, my name is Judy Jorgensen. I live in Annadale on the South Shore. And I was going to ask a question about Staten Island and homelessness because I was really outraged when I heard one of the uh, potential Republican candidates say an emphatic no to a homeless shelter on Staten Island. I realize nobody wants a homeless shelter in their neighborhood. However, is it fair for Staten Island families who have already suffered and become homeless to have to now go relocate to another borough? It's a strain and struggle on their children. They're already in bad shape. I really don't think it's the right thing to do, and I don't think that a two-letter answer with no discussion is the proper thing. 
for anybody in our community. I don't think it's right it's, or it's fair. So that was what I was originally going to ask about. But as I sit here and listen, I really think that the question that whoever is going to be our next mayor needs to tell us is, how are we going to help Staten Island's infrastructure? We don't have a hospital. We don't have enough roads. We don't have a plan for flooding. We've all been hurt, North Shore, South Shore, East Shore, West Shore. We were all hurt by flooding. We're all still picking up pieces of various things that have happened to us. We can no longer commute on our roads. We can't get on or off the island without paying a toll. We pay our fair share of taxes. People want to come and live on Staten Island. Our population is increasing. Our roads are getting more and more crowded. We don't have the same transpo public transportation the rest of the city has, yet we pay a fair majority of taxes. So how, how is the city of New York going to help the forgotten borough not be so forgotten? How are we going to make this island livable as we head into the next millennium? We're building this beautiful wheel. We're going to have a lot of tourism. How are we going to accommodate these people on the road? What happens if there is a problem at that new center they're building? We can't get in the hospital bed for six or eight hours on a good day. What happens if there's something really goes badly wrong? Uh, you know, these are all things that I think that somebody has to address. We're a big voting block. Doesn't anybody, you know, want to win us? I think that somebody real the, the, the question I have for whoever's going to be mayor, for the existing mayor, whoever's running, all these, everybody who's out there, what is your plan to get Staten Island up to par? The rest of the city's in a lot of trouble, too, but we're way down here in comparison. So what is the plan to get Staten Island equally prepared as the rest of the city of New York? Do, do you think Staten Islanders hold their public officials' feet to the fire enough or make enough noise or scream and yell Listen, and holler? the people of Staten Island are a unique group. I have lived here 56 years. There is a very, it's, it's a very community. Each neighborhood is a neighborhood. Everybody's no. proud of the neighborhood. North Shore, South Shore, East Shore, West Shore. But what we need to be on Staten Island, to your point, is much more cohesive in what we want because there's a lot of, you know, people on one side of the island want something much different than people on the other. So I think that's where our, we don't have a coalition, so we don't get anywhere. We just spin our wheel. But what I would like to see is somebody give us actual answers and not just tell us a story. I think our borough president is a great guy, and he, he does a lot of great things for Staten Island, but there's only so, so far he can go. We need help from the mayor and from the city to really address all these problems, and even the education. It's all infrastructure. If we don't have what we need. We don't have enough schools, but we keep building houses. More people come, and there's no, the schools are overcrowded. There's not proper special ed things. There is zero zero plan in the case of another Sandy. Zero. So what you really want to know is what infrastructure the city will build in Staten Island to deal with the increase in population. Yes. I would like to know, does anyone have any infrastructure plan that I haven't heard about? I read all the papers. I try to stay current. Is there some plan that I'm unaware of? Is there low-cost housing coming to help people get out of homelessness? Is there a plan for our uh, problem because we are an island and we're prone to flooding. Does, is there a plan for that? I know they had a tiny plan which builds it back, but it wasn't a very expensive plan. Is there a plan? We have seen autism spike on Staten Island. What's the plan for all these autistic kids? We have a tremendous opioid problem, which is leaving children homeless, small children. We don't have a drug treatment, a public drug treatment program here on Staten Island. These people are, have fallen victim to drugs. They can't they have to go to drug treatment in another borough. We don't have public transportation to get them to another borough. We have small children who are being placed in foster care because their parents have an opioid problem. They're in foster care in the Bronx. Their parents are in a hospital or a treatment center maybe in Long Island, and the family is based in Staten Island. How is that helping anybody? So I think somebody needs to give us a cohesive Staten Island plan. Okay. And we have a Staten Islander who's running for mayor. I think she should really, if she really wants to win the hearts and minds of Staten Island, why don't she develop a Staten Island plan? Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. I, I see we only have two more minutes, but uh, there are more people that want to ask questions, so I'd like to uh, give you an opportunity to speak. So come to the Listen microphone <laughs> and tell Hi. me what your name is. And Hi, my name is Patricia Keane, and Hi, I'm Patricia. a 
a registered nurse, and I'm also the treasurer of the New York State Nurses Association. So one thing we've seen, I know people have talked about health and the lack of the public hospital in Staten Island. I want to talk a little bit about mental health because I think sometimes that gets forgotten. And I think this mayor has done a lot. I think um, his wife has made mental health an initiative with the Thrive, and I think that's all great. But we have a problem with inpatient mental health here. We've actually lost, actually right after Sandy, we lost an inpatient detox, 30 beds. We lost um, another 30 beds at my hospital of acute inpatient psych care. We're probably going to lose another 15. Um, and then with the rebuild after Sandy of South Beach, we're going to lose another 60 of like intermediate care beds. The emphasis on outpatient care for people that experience mental illness is really important. And I'm not talking about institutionalizing people, but just like with a medical condition. When you have a chronic condition, um, you have ebbs and flows, you need a short period of hospitalization sometimes to get back. And you know, we really, um, we really need more resources in that area. And we've really experienced, you know, over a period of time, these beds have closed and really without any Anybody shining the light on that, or really, you know, they're all private facilities. They can close beds if they're not, you know, getting getting um, reimbursed to a level that they feel like they can maintain them. I know the city can't afford to open an acute care hospital here, but even if they had 30 beds of acute care at Seaview or something like that, I think it would help the community a lot. People do need a, um, you know, we have families when they're in crisis, they really don't have a place to go or bring their family member and. Bailey Seaton, really, I mean, they are going so to be closing the that. The city should be spending more money to develop crisis centers on Staten Island as well? I, I think inpatient mental health, I mean, it is a problem that we have with our private systems here. And even if they could just support that in some way, if they could give us, you know, they, they're talking right now ab about making hospitals in their system just psychiatric places. And again, I'm not talking about long-term institutionalization of people that experience mental illness. I'm talking about when someone's in a crisis, and they need to be admitted for a short period of time to get restabilized. Uh, we really don't have the resources, and the ones that we do have, like at Bailey Seton, uh, you know, the conditions there are pretty poor. Um, you know, even the nurses, I mean, we're glad that that's not going to be opening anymore, but we're going to lose beds as a result again. And I think a lot of these situations, you know, be it criminal justice, homelessness, um, substance misuse, a lot of these things are connected to mental health, and I think it's something that we forget about and often don't get to talk about. So. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'd like to, uh, I think we've got one more. If we, oh, you have one more. I'm so sorry. <coughs> Tell me I your think name. most of my thunder has been stolen by the previous <laughs> sp speakers. I was going to ask about how the mayor, my name is Bonnie, by the way, and I hey, live Bonnie. in Toad Hill, um, how the mayor would provide a safety net given the current for medical opioid, opioid addiction yeah, that's such a and all problem. the other health in issues that we've been talking about, what happens in the current political situation to the medical safety net in our community? Well, opioids are a big problem, especially on Staten Island. Exactly. And I think you, you'd like to find out from the mayor what he's going to do specifically to, other than you know, disarming um, the police officers with an antidote, what he's going to do to try to stop people from using opioids. My, yes, my understanding is that some, a lot of funding for opioid treatment is going to be cut. And so how would the yeah, mayor... Yeah, with the federal health care legislation. Actually, the mayor was talking about and this And probably uh, a lot yesterday. of other areas, too. Yeah. So how would the mayor provide a safety net for these? What was my first question? My would second like is... Uh, I mean, would you like to see him uh, uh, open up treatment centers here, counseling centers, things of that nature? That and, and an overall plan. Overall plan. Yes. Good idea. Like a preventative, so to just yes. deal yeah. with prevention. Here's what we do. If this happens, here's how we plan to support people who need to make support up for lost medically. Funding. Yeah. Okay, well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Thank you. Um, we want to thank all of you. You've been great. Um, all of you for attending, as well as thank our viewers for watching live on Facebook and following us on Twitter. Um, stay up to date with voting and elections. If you'd like to receive election alerts on your phone, you can text NYC Votes, NYC V O T E S, to 917 979 6377. Again, that's 917 979 6377. Now, many of you have, been, have really good issues and concerns that we might do as a story on Channel 2. If you have a story in mind,
maybe even some video, remember we are a TV station, please contact our, contact our newsroom on Facebook at CBS New York. On behalf of CBS2, WLNY-TV, 1055, we thank everyone who's participated in each of our borough's town halls. Here's some of my cards. Um, hold on a second. Thank you once again to our partners, WCBS Radio 880, 1010 Winds News, the New York Daily News, the City University, New York Immigration Coalition, and Common Cause New York. And finally, we remind you that CBS2 and WLNY-TV 1055 will be hosting upcoming debates this fall. Check your local listings because we want to make sure that some of your questions are asked of the candidates. Thank you again for participating.